the global elite just revealed their plan to control your money. I'm going to explain this to you in three simple, fast steps. Step number one, let's go over the monetary Trojan horse. So what is this? Well, there's a problem that the IMF, the Bank of International Settlements, and the Bank of England, all these central planners are talking about right now. It's the cost of cross-border payments. Now, they're claiming that this is creating massive amounts of global inequality. The wealth gap between the rich and the poor is growing exponentially larger. And if you listen to these people at Davos, like the gal that runs the IMF, I believe her last name is Georgieva, something to that effect, she'll claim that because these cross-border payments are so expensive, it's really holding down the poor. Therefore, if we could just solve this problem, we could eradicate global poverty. Well, like so many of the problems presented by the central planners, and this goes all the way back to Marx himself, they do get the problem correct, but their solution is wildly, wildly incorrect. And what I find interesting is whenever they propose a solution to a real problem, the solution inevitably leads to them achieving one of their big three objectives. And I talk about this all the time on my whiteboard videos. It's either going to lead to lower energy use through the global population or in aggregate total, so the global population uses less energy. This is where they want you to take a cold shower so they can continue to fly around the world in their private jet. They want to decrease the birth rate, and Bill Gates talks about this all the time, explicitly. A lot of people would argue they want to decrease the population just in general. <laughs> and this goes back to their worldview being rooted in this Malthusian idea that the world population is growing exponentially, resources are limited. Therefore, we have to do one of those two things, if not both, reduce energy use, reduce birth rate. And their final objective, and this goes without saying, is usurping power, control, and wealth. And in their eyes, we have these big problems. They believe that they are superior to all of us. They're intellectually superior, maybe they're genetically superior. So the only people on the planet Earth that can solve these big problems are the global elite, the people that meet at Davos. We, the general population, the average Joe and Jane, the 7 billion of us across the world, can never ever solve these problems. We just make the problems worse. This is how they see it through their eyes. So they have to have the power, the control, and the wealth for your benefit. If we give them control of the global economy, if we forego our freedom and our liberty to the global elite, well, of course, this is for the greater good. And just to be clear, this isn't George Gammon <laughs> saying these things. This is my opinion of the global elite's world view. So now that we understand this, let's go back to this monetary Trojan horse I was talking about. And this is a lot like climate change in the sense that I'm not here to debate whether it's real, not real, man-made, not man-made, but I am here to tell you that they don't care about the temperatures in the oceans. They don't care about baby seals. They just care about these three main objectives, and they just use climate change or the fear of climate change as this Trojan horse. They leverage the narrative to achieve their goals, and I think they're doing the exact same thing with these cross-border payments. We can go ahead and look at some graphs or charts from a recent paper from the BIS, the Bank of International Settlements. And they show, first of all, we could have this system where we have a central bank digital currency. More on that in just a moment. But it's really decentralized or more decentralized than they would like it. It's kind of the same system we have right now where we've got system A and system B, we'll say. This really represents the United States. This is Europe. 
We've got the Fed as the central bank over here, the ECB, and we've got the average Joe and the average Jane. So the average Joe wants to send Jane, let's say, $100. Well, this goes through a very cumbersome process because it might have to go through a specific bank here in the U.S., we'll say Wells Fargo, and if they don't have an account with, let's say, HSBC, then it has to go through a correspondent bank. And depending how obscure the banks are, maybe it's a credit union or something like that, it may have to go through two or three of these correspondent banking arrangements to get all the way over to Jane, even if she's requesting dollars. And if she's requesting euros, then it gets even more complicated and it becomes more costly. It takes a long time and it's very inefficient. This is a problem that I will grant the people like Georgieva. They're pointing out it is correct. This is a problem, but the solution isn't bigger government and more central planning. <laughs> the solution is the opposite of that. So in this BIS paper, they say, okay, well, an improvement on this system would be something like this, where we still have system one and system two, but now through a central bank digital currency within these systems, we create more uniformity. So there might just be one bank under the Fed or one type of bank under the ECB. And because we have one system over here and one system over there, we could have the same type of clearinghouse and we wouldn't need these correspondent banks. And even if we did, the IMF could serve that role or they could be in control of whatever the clearinghouse or the correspondent system was. Going back to the original example, there are multiple clearinghouses and there are multiple correspondent banking arrangements, which reduces efficiency, but it's more decentralized. So it's a give and a take. But this isn't their utopian vision. What they'd love to see is the third option. And this goes back to that BIS paper. But so in their utopian vision, we would only have one system. So they would eliminate system A and system B, and we would be left with just one system that I call system K. And this is for system Klaus, <laughs> which is what all the global elite want to see. So then you would eliminate the banks. There would be one system that we'll say the World Economic Forum and the IMF would be in control of. We would have the central bank digital currency. So then if the average Joe wanted to send money or currency units to the average Jane, well, he would just go to his account at the Fed and he would just wire the Fed coins denominated in dollars over to the ECB, and that's where Jane would access her account or the $100 in Fed coins that Joe just sent her. So in this scenario in System K for System Klaus, <laughs> or maybe it should have been System GE or Global Elite, but they would control everything. And whether it was through the BIS, or the IMF, it doesn't really matter. It's really the same people that are involved, the same people pulling the strings. So the global elite have explicitly said that this is the best system. It's far more efficient if they control everything. So again, you have to go back and look at what they're saying, what they're saying in the media, what they're saying in their YouTube videos and what they say in their interviews with CNBC at Davos, and look at it through the lens of their objectives. And I would ask each one of you watching this video right now, if we move into system Klaus, does that give them more power, more control, and more wealth? The answer is absolutely. That's why I have a very hard time believing that their true intentions are actually to serve the poor by reducing their cost for these cross-border payments. To me, this just seems like a narrative they're trying to push, a monetary Trojan horse, so they can get further and further to their end goal, which is controlling your money. Step number two, food, energy, 
N dollars. In step number one, we went over how the global elite are pushing this narrative and trying to create this Trojan horse so they can take more control over the global monetary system. But there's more to the story. We have to dig even deeper. So in this step, again, we're going to go over food, energy, and dollars. And then in step number three, we're going to connect all of these dots. So hopefully you can get a better idea of what the end game might look like. So let's start by going over something that most people understand, but only at surface level. It's a fact that most people hear all the time, but they rarely put much thought into. And what I'm referring to is the dollar being used to settle 60 plus percent of the transactions globally, even between countries that have nothing to do with the United States. And this is especially applicable to commodities such as food and energy. As most of you know from watching my videos, just listening to the news, that oil, as an example, is settled in dollars. So even if you have Turkey, let's say, buying oil from Saudi Arabia, Turkey needs to come up with those dollars to buy the oil. They can't buy oil in their local currency, the Turkish lira. So let's move back to how this works for the United States and how it's so much different for every other country in the world and how this system of the US dollar being the reserve currency means the United States to a certain degree has control not only over the global monetary system through the euro dollar banking system, more on that in just a moment, but also has control to a certain degree over the countries that are able to quite literally buy food and energy. So let's say the United States needs to import oil, they need to import fertilizer, so potash from Canada, and let's just say they're importing avocados from Mexico. That's my best rendition of an avocado <laughs> right here. Looks more like an onion, but we'll just, it's got an A there, so you know it's an avocado. So the United States doesn't really have to earn dollars to buy the avocados, oil, and fertilizer they need. Theoretically, they could just print the dollars. But let's move over to Turkey. Like we said earlier, for Turkey to buy the oil they need from Saudi Arabia, they need to earn the dollars. And let's say they're buying fertilizer from Canada. They need to earn dollars. They could also get dollar liquidity from the euro dollar banking system. So I've got euro bank here. I'm not saying that this is a European bank. It's just in the euro dollar banking system. So this could be HSBC. This could be Deutsche Bank. This could be XYZ Bank in the Cayman Islands. But it's just a bank that can create dollars by lending them into existence. And it's a cashless, reserveless system. And this is something that Jeff Snyder teaches us. And it's something I've gone over in several other videos. So I'm not going to dive down that rabbit hole in this video for the sake of time. But we have to understand that Turkey can get dollar liquidity from these euro dollar banks. And they can get the dollars they need by doing what? Actually earning the dollars to buy the stuff that they need from other countries. But as most of you know from watching the news, Turkey is in deep trouble right now. They can't get the dollars they need to buy the oil from, let's say, Saudi Arabia. So they're having to print their own currency to buy dollars to buy oil or commodities. What does that do to the currency? It makes it depreciate rapidly to the point where they're on the brink of hyperinflation. And we see something similar playing out right now in Sri Lanka where they literally cannot get the fuel they need to operate the economy. And this is creating tremendous amounts of civil unrest. But let's take this a step further. If the United States wanted to bail out Sri Lanka or bail out Turkey for that matter, what could they do? They could set up a swap line. And we heard about swap lines going back to the repo crisis and then the Cervasa sickness 
where the United States extended these dollar swap lines to some countries, a few countries, not all countries, and definitely not Turkey or Sri Lanka, where their central bank could access the dollars their local corporations need to function. Now, what's interesting here is this was set up by the Fed as though it's a panacea, and it's really not. Because although there was a swap line, let's say set up with Turkey, those Turkish banks would still have to lend those dollars to the corporations. But if the corporations in Turkey aren't credit worthy, those banks aren't going to lend them the dollars they need, and they're still in the same predicament. And this is why I say the United States, along with the euro dollar banking system, has such a high degree of control over who in the world is getting food and energy because they control the supply or access to dollars, which is needed for 60% plus of the transactions globally and an even higher percentage for commodities that are almost exclusively settled in US dollars. So the main takeaway here is in a crisis situation, the United States can always print dollars to get food and energy, assuming the suppliers are willing to sell it to them. And that's a topic for a completely separate video. We might address that more in step number three, where the countries outside of the United States can't print currency to buy the stuff they need. They actually have to earn the dollars first. They have to produce more than they consume. To give you an idea of how this works, let's go over this very simple example to make sure we're all on the same page. It starts with the US government, your drunk, insolvent Uncle Sam, <laughs> spending money like the drunken sailor he is, sending out all those stimmy checks. Those go to your friend and family member, Fred. Fred takes the stimulus money and he needs a carpet for his house. So he goes over to Khan, who lives in Turkey, and Khan is a carpet maker and he produces far more carpets than he consumes. And obviously these stick figures are just a proxy for their local economies. This is the United States economy, the Turkish economy, and the Saudi Arabian economy. So Khan needs to produce more than he consumes to get those dollars from your friend and family member Fred because he needs the dollars to buy oil from Muhammad. So what you've noticed in this simple example is that Muhammad and Khan have to produce something. In fact, they have to produce more than they consume in order to get the dollars they need to buy the stuff they need. But your friend and family member Fred, in other words, the United States, they don't have to produce anything to get the stuff they need to consume. All they have to do is print the money. This puts the United States in an incredible position of power over the global economy and over other countries because to a certain degree, they control the money. And this position of power is something the global elite want for themselves. Step number three. Now let's go over the end game for how the global elite want to control your money and potentially control your life. So in step number one, we discussed how at Davos this week, they're really pushing this narrative of solving the problem of cross-border payments. We need to lower the price. And of course, to do this, what needs to happen is the IMF needs to control the process or the current system of these correspondent banks and the clearing houses. They need to control the whole process. It needs to be centralized under one system. This is how we're going to get the cost of those cross-border payments down. So we've got Klaus, obviously, holding this sign saying cross-border payments. He's pushing it with the IMF, the BIS, the Bank of England, pretty much all of these Davos types. So you can sit there and say, well, George, I understand what you're saying, but maybe they have good intentions. Granted, maybe their intentions are good. I'll absolutely give you that. But regardless of whether their intentions are good or bad, the net result is still the same. 
And this is where the central planners themselves usurp more power, control, and wealth. So again, regardless of what the intention is, the net result is still the same. And as Milton Friedman teaches us, the bigger government gets, or the bigger the central planning entity gets, the more power it has, the more it attracts the sociopaths, megalomaniacs, and people who have an insatiable lust for that power. So even if the current cast of characters is as pure as the driven snow, and I know most of you watching this video right now would not put the global elite in that category, but let's assume they are. Sooner or later, the more power they receive, the higher the probability that we get someone in control of this global monetary system that is the next Mussolini, the next Stalin, or potentially even worse. So let's dive into the details. In step number two, we went over how the current global reserve currency, the United States dollar, accounts for about 60% plus of global transactions and an even higher percentage for food, energy, and commodities. So this is how they'd like to see the system set up. Over on this side, we'll say it represents the Fed, the United States. On this side, the ECB and the European Union. So, of course, we would have Fedcoin, a central bank digital currency, a local central bank digital currency for this domestic economy. And over here, we would have a central bank digital currency. We'd call it the, the ECB bucks, we'll say. <laughs> so we've got ECB bucks and we've got the Fedcoin. We've got the balance sheet of the Fed, the IMF in this case, or just any central planning entity and the ECB on the left. We have assets, liabilities on the right. So in this scenario, Joe, the average Joe, his assets or his currency would be a liability of the Federal Reserve. He'd have a bank account with the Fed and he would have Fed coin denominated in dollars. So that's a liability of the Fed asset of Joe. Well, what would be the offsetting asset for this liability? Most likely SDRs. And this would be a liability of the central planning entity, in this case, the IMF. And it would be the exact same for the ECB. Now, those of you who watch my videos that are really paying attention are probably scratching your head right now and saying, wait a minute, George. This looks very similar to the system, the domestic system we currently have right here in the United States, where you have a central bank like the Fed and they have bank reserves denominated in dollars that are liabilities and those are assets of the other commercial banks. And you would be spot on. In this scenario, the central planning entity would pretty much be the central bank of the central bankers. So all the domestic banks in the United States, like Wells Fargo, Bank of America, and in Europe, let's say Deutsche Bank and HSBC, they would become branches or just extensions of the individual central bank. So the same type of setup where instead of bank reserves denominated in dollars, now the assets of the central banks would be these ESDRs. So that would be a liability on, let's say, the IMF's balance sheet. So if the average Joe wanted to send currency units to Jane, let's say he was buying a car from her or maybe uh, oil, commodities, we'll get into that in just a moment, but any type of stuff, then what would happen is the balance sheet would go from this setup to this setup. So the assets would go to zero the liabilities would go to zero. Because again, remember, Joe has to use his Fed coin to buy the stuff from Jane. And so then what would happen is the IMF would simply transfer the assets of the Fed over to the ECB. So their liabilities would be pretty much identical. And then what would happen on the ECB's balance sheet is they would have additional SDRs as assets and they would have the additional we'll call them euro bucks, as a liability on their balance sheet, Jane gets paid, the stuff goes over to Joe. So again, if you watch a lot of my videos, you can see that this is pretty much the exact same setup that we have 
currently domestically with the Fed, the central bank, and the domestic banks under them if the average Joe was trying to send money to the average Jane here in the United States. But instead of having it based in each individual country with more of a decentralized type of global system, now we would have it completely centralized to where we just had one central bank and one global reserve currency. Central bank, most likely IMF, global reserve currency moves from the dollar to the ESDR. So let's think this through. If the ESDR is now the global reserve asset, most likely the commodities that we talked about in step number one, the avocados, the potash or fertilizer, and the oil that was being purchased or sold, regardless of the country, would be settled in these ESDRs. So each country, whether it was the United States or in this case Europe, would have to earn this currency in order to buy the stuff they need. But there would be one entity right in the middle controlled by the global elite that wouldn't have to earn any of the currency units needed to buy the stuff. They would be the puppet master. They would be in complete control. So just to review, right now the United States combined with the banks and the euro dollar system have control, for the most part, of the supply of currency units denominated in dollars circulating or available to these countries to buy the stuff they need. We use the example of Turkey and Sri Lanka as current examples of crisis situations where they don't have enough dollars to simply buy oil or buy energy and they're getting an unbelievable amount of civil unrest. So in this new system, the global elite and the global elite alone take the position of the United States and the banks in the euro dollar system. In other words, they have total control over who has access to the currency units they need to buy commodities like food and energy. And let's not forget, if they don't like what you're doing, they have the power and the control to just go ahead and freeze your assets, just like we've seen the United States or the West freeze the dollar assets of the Russian central bank when Russia invaded Ukraine. But unfortunately, the story doesn't end there. This definitely would give them control over the global monetary system, but it would also give them control over the commodities and who gets those commodities. And this takes us right into what I think the end game actually is. It's not just about controlling your money. It's about controlling your life. How would they do this? Well, Let's look at this through the lens of the person who has had the greatest influence on Klaus himself. That would be Henry Kissinger. And to quote Mr. Kissinger, whoever has control of the food controls the people. Whoever has control of the energy controls the countries. Whoever has control of the money controls the world. So by pushing this narrative that they're just all about helping the poor and all they want to do is just lower the cost of these cross-border payments. Coincidentally, it takes us right into a system where they control the food, the energy, and the money. So are their intentions good or are their intentions bad? I'll let you be the judge. For more content that will help you build wealth and thrive in a world of out-of-control central banks and big governments, check out this playlist right here, and I will see you on the next video.